Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel where I talk about all things tech and finance. And in this video, I'm going to be going over the theoretical and applied applications of vector machines. Support vector machines are essentially classification type algorithms where given some labeled data set, we want to create a model that represents this labeled data. And when we are given new data, we want to predict our new data's labels as they are coming in. There are many different types of forms of a given vector machine model, such as linear discriminant analysis, quadratic discriminant analysis, and support vector machines in general. So let's begin with LDAs, or linear discriminant analysis. An LDA is one of the simplest classification techniques out there. Also, if all of our underlining assumptions are met with this model, then an LDA is the best discriminator function to use. However, the data that we often use in the real world and in our upcoming tech demo is not often the case. The basic idea is that we use linear combinations to transform higher dimensional data into one dimensional space where a boundary line is optimized to separate your data into different classes. The underlying assumptions to use LDA are that the groups are normal and the covariance matrices are assumed to be identical. Under the hood, we want to find a vector W such that when an observation comes in, we multiply the vector W by a matrix X to get a scalar value greater than a fixed value C or a cost value. If W times X is less than or equal to C, then we can determine which of the two groups the observation belongs. Linear discriminant analysis becomes a quadratic discriminant analysis or QDA when the nonlinear boundary is used instead of a linear boundary. And what I mean by boundary is that it's essentially some given function that has a linearity or a nonlinearity function applied to this given model. So before we even get into support vector machines, let's sort of pick apart what support vector machines are. A vector is a multivariate observation. It is essentially a point in multidimensional space. So think of this as an observation with lots and lots of features. A support vector is a boundary that helps distinguish the two groups. The boundary themselves are support vectors. And a machine does not really mean anything. In a support vector machine, the algorithm is essentially trying to maximize the space between different groups. This is known as maximizing the margin of separation. SVMs do not require any assumptions at all and is very flexible for which data you use. In my past experience, and as noted in a later demo, SVM doesn't really classify more than two groups very well. When working with real data sets, it can be very complicated to find a clear separation between classes. But there are two ways that you could address this grouping issue. The first is to set a soft margin. This is essentially a threshold of allowed misclassifications. Even though our boundaries won't perfectly split our data into distinct groups, we can minimize this error. The other way to address this grouping issue is to use nonlinear functions to represent the patterns within our data set. We do this by applying different transformation functions on our data to change the shape of our data set. For instance, if our data followed a horizontal line pattern and there is a group of observations that exist in the middle of our pattern, we can transform our data by applying a quadratic function. We can then better distinguish these groups as noted in this visualization. At a very high level, we know what LDA, QDA, and SVMs are, so let's go ahead and try to apply this in our studio. So in this technical demonstration, I'm going to be applying LDA, QDA, and SVM um, with the related teaching assistant evaluation type data set. The link is in the description if you want to follow along to download that data. Um, I've already went ahead and I loaded in uh, my seed. I set my working directory to wherever my data set exists. Loaded in my given packages. Uh, this contains the SVM function. This is the LDA, QDA functions and Carrot has some really neat functions related to matrix statistics. And so I already loaded in my data. And the point here is that given all of my independent variables, whether or not the TA is a native English speaker, all the way up to class size, I'll be predicting the specific metric on my target variable, where my target is the uh, teaching evaluation, where one is a low rating and three is the highest rating that you can possibly be given. 
So let's do a really quick summary on our data so we can see what like you know what more in depth we are working with. Uh, looks like we're not working with any NAs. The minimum value of our target is a one, maximum is a three, which is a good sign. An additional test that we want to check is to see whether or not our given data set uh, with our independent variables are normally distributed. And just by the nature of our given features, the observations do not look normally distributed, but we can do an additional test to see if they are. So a very popular technique is to use a Shapiro-Wilkes test. And essentially what we want to see is to see if the p-value is greater than 0.05. In this case, it's not, meaning we can't assume a normality for that particular feature. And as we go through each and every one of our uh, features, none of our given features are normally distributed, which will make our technique of LDA not very strong, and we will see that very soon. And for the purposes of our LDA, QDA, and SVM type models, I'll go ahead and convert our target variable into a factor so that our overall algorithm will not confuse to use which type of method, such as a regression type method or a classification type method. So given our observations, let's actually attempt to visualize our given data over here. Uh, notice that with the x, I'm working with the x variable of a course, y variable of class size. It can be very arbitrary, uh, but just given these observations, I felt that this was probably the best representation of our data, even though very soon you'll see that that's not really the case. Uh, I'll be coloring based on the target and Based on the target, I'll also be changing the shape so that it could be a little bit more easy to identify which observation belongs with which. I'll also be assigning the colors. So this is what our graph will look like. We can do a zoom over here, expand that out. Look, maybe it looks a little bit. So based on our LDA, QDA, and SVM type classification algorithms, we are trying to identify which boundary sets can then distinguish which of these points belong with each other. And so we have these black circles. We want to find some boundary line that distinguishes these black circles from, let's say, these red triangles or these red squares. Since we have three different categories, we are looking for three different boundary lines that could potentially separate all of these uh, factors into their individual groups. And that's essentially the point of the type of algorithms that we will be utilizing in this session. Also, as you can tell that this is going to be quite difficult in order to visualize which group is going to be distinguished from the other group because these observations, these points are so almost like really coincided with each other and it'll be very difficult for a machine algorithm to sort of identify which group belongs to which type of uh, observations. When given the opportunity to classify observations to whichever group that it belongs with, I would always recommend utilizing the LDA uh, because more often than not, if all of your assumptions are met within your given data, LDA actually performs way, way better than all of the other type of SVM models that are out there. Uh, and it's just true if all the assumptions are met and everything is linearly distributed and so on and so forth. But more often the case when we are working with real data, it's just not, not true. So let's go ahead and run our LDA function. Uh, this LDA came from the mass library. And as always, it's very similar to like a regression type formula. We have our target, which is our Y variable tilde, all of our other features, which uh, symbolizes the period. Data comes from data and we can classify this as classification and the cost function is 10. This is an arbitrary scalar value. And in the theoretical portion, the C value is what the cost value here is equal to. Uh, note that I did not need to uh, separate the data into a training and a testing set because uh, the way that we will be doing it is that we have some model that we have trained based on all of our data and we just plug in all of our data in order to generate some prediction based on that class value. And then we'll just create a table matrix uh, related to our predictions and our true values. So it's very similar to like a KNN video that I've done earlier where we have like one gigantic model and we didn't need to separate our data from there. So let's go ahead and run our prediction values. Prediction of LDA, LDA over here, and it's given a bunch of posterior observations. Uh, but the main point here is to look at the class. These are our predicted class elements. Uh, we will also be comparing this. We'll be tabling it out with the data of our target. 
uh, which is our true observations, and we'll see how well this has done. So let's run this and do a C matrix on that. The point here is that um, pretty much the most important values in this given confusion matrix is the diagonal values, which is the accuracy or the accurate observations that have been correctly uh, pinpointed to that particular group. And this is where the caret function comes into play, confusion matrix, and uh, it just gives spits out a bunch of other statistics related to our confusion matrix here. And as we can see, our overall accuracy is a solid 56 0.29%, which is um, not very good. <laughs> and we'll see if we could try and spruce up that accuracy. We're also given a bunch of other uh, statistics related to the confusion matrix. Um, and this is just related to how each of these observations uh, within our confusion matrix can be sort of manipulated into uh, as, a, as a parameter into an overall function, and these represent those specific functions. And you can always take a look as to what these particular values represent, and they all have a certain underlying meaning behind each of these values. So let's go on to the QDA real quick. Similar to the LDA type function, I'm pretty much doing the exact same thing, um, I, except that I have a QDA function, I'm keeping the cost function the same, and we're doing the same classification. The only real difference between the LDA and the QDA, as I mentioned in the theoretical uh, portion of this video, is that QDA works with nonlinear boundaries, so it's like nonlinear functions to resemble those boundaries to try and distinguish which type of observations belong to a different type of category. and it just applies a, a non-linear function to that. So let's see how well this improves. Uh, do the exact same thing, and we have a accuracy type of 57.62%. Note that I'm not tuning uh, the models for maybe potentially better uh, accuracy improvements. I'm just sort of doing like right out of the box of our given observation to see how well they perform. Um, so as we can see, we have a 57 0.62% and compare that to 56.29. So obviously that's not very strong at all, like a strong increase, but it is better than an LDA as we can see here. Now, last but not least, let's actually do the SVM model. Pretty much the exact same thing. Uh, we are going to be having an SVM type model. We just be doing the exact same thing of the classification type algorithm, same cost function, same data sets, and just run that over here. And really neat thing about the SVM package, which comes from the E1071 uh, package over there, is that we can have, uh, we could call a summary on this function and see what type of, you know, really unique uh, parameters that are associated with our call function there. And um, because why not, when we are trying to visualize how well our model is doing. Uh, we could try to attempt to see how well this SVM function has been doing. And as we can see in this graph over here is that the visualization of our SVM type model is not really rep well represented with our given observations or features like course and class size over here. And that's mainly because our observations are so coincided and we will largely see more of this if we are working with huge, huge hyper dimension type uh, data where we have maybe potentially thousands of features and just having a, a two dimensional plot is not very valuable to our discovery of which observations belong to which groups. You could also attempt to plot many different variations or permutations combinations of the X and Y variables that are given in this data set here, but I already did that earlier, not in this video, but I already did that and the observations uh, that are represented by this graph, the best representation is this course versus class size and all the others are pretty much as bad as this one. All right, now that we got the plotting out of the way, let's do exact same thing or predictions and we can be comparing our matrices into that confusion matrix and voila, right here, the accuracy is 74.17% and we can look at our other various statistics that are provided by the confusion matrix. So essentially the bottom line here is that SVMs are actually really, really good with nonlinear type data. Pretty much no assumptions are needed in order to use an SVM. And it's very flexible to use when you're working with data that you're not really familiar with. And also you probably don't even really need to transform your data in order to make it more normally distributed or more linear for that matter, in order to get a somewhat more 
like a, I guess a robust model in order to use like right out of the box. So I hope that you enjoyed this video. Uh, make sure you leave a like and hit that subscribe button with those notifications on. And I hope to see you in the next video. Thank you guys so much for watching.